Sitting in a frame in my mother's house is a picture of five-year-old me. I am standing in the backyard of my grandparents' house in Arizona. In the picture, I am smiling and I am holding a salt shaker. Put that there for now. Sometimes you need some context to make sense of a picture. So here it is. I'm in the backyard smiling with the salt shaker because at the time I believed that if you sprinkled salt on the tail of a cottontail rabbit, it would freeze and then you would be able to pet it. I believed this because I was told this. I cannot tell you how many hours over how many visits I spent in that backyard occupied and entertained with nothing but a salt shaker. And no, I never did manage to catch one of those rabbits. The message here could be about the things that we tell our children, but no, that is not what stands out to me about this story. In fact, I have every intention of arming my own daughters with salt shakers of their own, and maybe in 10 or 20 years, I'll send them a copy of this sermon. But what stands out to me is not that I believed it was possible at the time for this to work, I was five after all, but that I believed it for years, more years than I care to admit after that. And while I am grateful I have since cast that belief aside, I'm a bit terrified about what other ideas of equal or even greater absurdity I might still be holding on to. There are different types of bad ideas with different consequences. In the case of the salt shaker and the rabbits, the consequence would be a sort of personal humiliation I truly hope to never experience. Just imagine the alternate universe where 30-year-old me meets someone with a pet rabbit and asks innocently if the animal minds having its tail salted. Ugh. The same fear applies to wondering what word you might have been misusing or mispronouncing your entire life, or both, misusing and mispronouncing, and let's face it, it's probably words, plural. Oof. But there are, of course, greater consequences than personal embarrassment. Think about learning that that thing that you have been recycling for the last 20 years is not actually recyclable. And not just recently, that thing was never recyclable, and you've just been wrong. Or this example. A Kaiser Family Foundation poll found that the majority of Americans believe the government spends too much money on foreign aid. When asked if they knew how much the government spent, 78% of respondents said they did know, and 95% of those were wrong. And not just a little wrong. The average guess was the government spends 25% of the federal budget on foreign aid, foreign aid. But the actual amount, it's about 1%. The survey then asked if the survey respondents' opinions changed as a result of hearing this. After they heard the that they had overestimated the number by a factor of 25, the number of people who felt that the government spent too much dropped in half. And the number of people who felt that the government spent too little, that number more than doubled. And that's good for the 1,505 people surveyed in the poll, but what about everyone else? And what about all the other things we know that we don't actually know? We are not the first generation to grapple with misinformation and its effects. In a moment, I want to share some commentary from our tradition, but first I need to explain the Torah verses that this commentary is based upon. We are in the midst of Leviticus, a book focused on holiness, which is tied to notions of purity and impurity. Holy things must be kept pure, and therefore impure things and impure people, those must be kept away. A lot of things could make a person impure, and the good news is most of these things are temporary. If you wait some time and you do some rituals, you can again become pure. The Torah portion opens with rules about women who have just given birth. After birth, 
A woman is said to be impure for seven days, followed by an additional 33 for a total of 40 days. That is, for a male child. If she has a female child, it becomes 14 days, followed by 66 for a total of 80 days. And that is double. Trying to make sense of texts like this through our contemporary lenses of gender equality and just basic fairness and decency can be difficult. And I will share an interpretation of that explains this discrepancy, which I found meaningful. But first, I want to discuss some reactions to these rules. If you've heard rabbinic sermons, you've no doubt heard us share the insightful views of medieval commentators. These great scholars are studied and cited centuries later because their work illuminates Torah and our tradition still to this day. But let what I am about to share be a reminder that great as these thinkers were, they were human. And great as their knowledge was, it was finite. Ibn Ezra writes that the discrepancy between baby boys and baby girls is because a female child takes twice as long to develop as a male one. A Barbanel adds that male children give off more heat, which is why they uh, cook quicker. Gersonides says it has something to do with female fetuses needing thicker blood, which takes longer after birth to come back to normal in the mother. Nachmanides says the mother's body temperature affects the outcome. Cooler bodies produce females, warmer ones, males. The easy thing to do is to read these ideas and to scoff at their ignorance. The harder thing is to consider what ideas we all hold with certainty that will one day be seen as equally laughable. So how can we prevent this? How can we know what we don't know? Back to Torah. Again, we are in a section dealing with purity and impurity. And just as people can be pure or impure, so can buildings, so can houses. And if your house is impure, the Torah says you need to tell someone. And the person you tell is the priest. But the Torah instructs a specific way you must do so. Kenaga nir a li babayit. The modern translation is something like a plague has appeared upon my house something like a plague. Rashi says that even if you know it is a plague, even if the black mold has swallowed up the, the entire second story of your house, you still have to say it like this, with this hesitancy. The Jewish publication translation from about a century ago, I think really captures it well. They translate the verse as, there seemeth to me to be as it were a plague in the house. But we're left to wonder, why, why all these weasel words? Why not just say what you see? Rabbi Bradley Artson suggests the answer to both questions, the initial one I asked of overcoming our own potential false beliefs, and this unusual wording is the same, and that answer is humility. As Rabbi Artson writes, we are not God and we are far from perfect. The way we acquire knowledge and wisdom is limited by our own five senses, our own life experiences, our own subjective intuition. Human wisdom and judgment is of necessity limited, imperfect, and provisional. He continues by saying the real message the Torah gives us here is that our most passionate conviction, that's black mold, I can see it, or yes, I am sure that that router is plugged in, or if I vote for that politician who says they will cut U.S. foreign aid, I'm going to get a 25% tax cut. Whatever it is we believe, it might be something wrong or something we ultimately later come to reject. Reading through the commentary on that verse about pregnancy discrepancy, it wasn't the ignorance of anatomy that jumped out at me. No, what jumped out at me was what the commentator said after they made these statements. Ibn Ezra wrote, uh, after a female gestates for twice as long as a male, he adds the fact that everyone knows that this is tried and true. 
Nachmanides, when he shared his theory on body temperature, he ended by saying, it is well known that chilling diseases take longer to heal than hot ones. The only thing more embarrassing than telling someone in my case that salt will cause a rabbit to stay still would be to follow it up with, everybody knows that. A little humility, even when you know you're right, can go a long way. Because as we've seen, even when we know we're right, sometimes we're wrong, really wrong. I'm sure many of us heard the original Torah verse about the extended impurity that comes from having a baby girl and dismissed it as another example of misogyny in our tradition. And maybe that's right, but maybe not. I want to end by offering an alternative explanation for why it is that girls cause the mother to remain impure twice as long as boys. In an essay in the Torah, A Woman's Commentary, Beth Alpert Nahai acknowledges women were treated unequally in biblical society. They were, to use her word, expendable. If there were more mouths to feed than there was food on the table, it was the girls who would go hungry. May we never experience such horror. But here is Beth Alpert Nahai's theory. The priestly authors seem to be concerned about these very injustices, and they try to avert such tragedies by ensuring that baby girls stay in the protective care of their mothers for an extended period of time. Is that why women who give birth to girls are kept apart from society for double the time as those that give birth to boys? Who knows? I doubt we will ever know the rationale with certainty, but it is certainly a more intriguing theory than what the traditional commentary offers or our own snap judgments on the attitudes of the biblical authors. But it is only after we open our minds to other possibilities or to the possibility that our take on something might not be the right one that we can consider the possibilities. Can you hear Atzon? May it be God's will.